to introduce our very last speaker today, last not least, David Verity from London, who will present on the challenge of sinoid wing um, meningioma. David, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My title is The Challenge of Sphenoid Wing Meningioma. The sphenoid bone is an unpaired one in the middle cranial fossa with the central body containing the cella tertica, two greater wings forming the anterior parts of the middle cranial fossae, and the lesser wings making the posterior parts of the anterior cranial fossae. The cleft between the greater and the lesser wings form the superior orbital fissure, and the clinoid processes are important features of, sphen of the sphenoid bone in skull-based surgery. Now, sphenoid wing meningiometer uh, are centered on the sphenoid wing, and 20% of all intracranial meningiomas are indeed sphenoid wing meningiomas. They are slow growing and they originate from the outer arachnoid meningeal epithelial cells. The World Health Organization defines three grades. 90% of them are grade one, and these do not invade the brain parenchyma. Grade two, on the other hand, show frequent mitoses and an increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, and it includes atypical variants. And the more aggressive grades three and four show more mitoses, necrosis, and invasion of brain parenchyma. But the point to remember from this slide is that 90% of all sphenoid wing meningiometer are grade one. Now, for, for patients presenting with sphenoid wing meningioma, they may do so in three separate ways, with a mass effect, vascular congestion, or visual impairment, or a combination of all three. Patients present with globe displacement, reduced movement and squint, or distortion of the globe with change in their refraction. They may also present with vascular congestion as seen on the bottom right of the slide, chronic conjunctival chemosis, chemosis and dilated episcleral vessels, and visual impairment can occur due to exposure keratopathy or compression of the nerve either in the orbit or behind the orbit. Now the radiology shows that meningiomas can occur on the inner and the outer aspects of the sphenoid wing with bony and soft tissue components as shown on this slide. And the spectrum of presentation can vary from being an incidental finding to congestion and optic nerve compression as previously mentioned. Bone involvement occurs in 30%, but 12% can be primary intraosseous involvement. And very rarely, there may be bilateral disease as you see in this patient with tumor extending into the orbital apex and through the orbital fissures. In this case, soft tissue is also seen in the left temporalis fossa and in the middle cranial fossa. Now the treatment of sphenoid wing meningioma is challenging. These diseases are not curable, but they're containable. And we monitor the patient and consider orbital decompression where there is neuropathy or significant proptosis or subtotal resection with neurosurgical colleagues where there is a significant cranial component. Radiotherapy is indicated, and we consider that for grade one tumors where they are inoperable or where there is progression. The indications for grade two are less certain, but there's a strong case for radiotherapy. And in grade three tumors, radiotherapy is indicated even after complete resection. I'm going to present three cases. The first being the 60 year old gentleman who presented with a very gradual onset over seven years of right-sided proptosis with reduced visual acuity of six over nine, subjectively darker color vision, a grade one relative afferent pupillary defect and six millimeters of proptosis as you see on the left of the slide. His radiology confirmed hyperostosis of the bone, crowding at the orbital apex and where there is some doubt about the tumor, we should not forget that a, a gallium dotatate CTMR image has a role to play. These tumors express somatostatin receptors and radio labeled gallium avidly attaches to this receptor. And this can be harnessed in terms of a gallium dotatate scan, very useful where there is diagnostic uncertainty or where subtle recurrence is suspected. And an example of a dotatate scan is seen on the left of this slide. So this patient underwent a lateral wall decompression, and although these are not uh, images from his surgery, they serve to uh, show how we approach the lateral wall through an upper lid skin crease on the left, exposing the lateral wall, reflecting the periosteum over the lateral wall as shown here, and then removing 
a large section of the bony part of the lateral wall or a lateral wall fenestration, as shown with an oscillating saw here, and the fenestration has been created and the soft tissue uh, lies behind the malleable and as yet the unopened periosteum. But in this patient, you see here his perioperative images, as a reminder, the imaging at the top, and you can see here the residual part of the lateral wall uh, after much of the bony and soft tissue components have been removed. Here you see a bony fragment being removed. And on the right in the middle here, you see the soft tissue components being removed. And we undertook this with the Elman radio frequency cautery, just demonstrating the significant amount of soft tissue, but by no means all that was removed in this particular case. So the gentleman was kind enough to keep post-operative photographs and to allow us to use these. And these show quite significant chemosis in the first 48 hours, but beginning to resolve by one week and two weeks and finally resolving a number of months later. But he underwent surgery for both his proptosis and his reduced visual uh, color appreciation. So how did he fare? Well, you can see that the visual acuity improved and remember that he underwent a lateral debulk, not a medial, but despite this, his subjective color appreciation improved, as did his relative afferent pupillary defect, as did his proptosis by approximately four millimeters. I have a second case to outline some of the challenges involved in such patients, because this gentleman presented with a history of prostatic carcinoma and a lesion at the posterior part of the lateral orbit, as shown on the slide on the left. And he had four millimeters of proptosis, reduced color appreciation, and a relative afferent pupillary defect. And I'm showing here the 3D soft tissue reconstruction because the lesion is in blue and the optic nerve is uh, colored pink to purple as you see here. And look how the lesion is uh, kinking the nerve as it travels around the back uh, to, of the orbit. And you can see at this point here just how constricted the nerve is around the lesion. So without yet a diagnosis, we undertook a, an incisional biopsy through a lateral canthotomy, once again, using the radio frequency cautery as shown here, and the pathology identified a grade one meningioma. So what would be the next step? Well, again, we considered a medial wall decompression because this would carry minimum risk to the patient, and that's what was undertaken. And you can see here the preoperative images, uh, particularly the coronal scans here, and the post-operative showing a reasonable reduction uh, and increase in the volume uh, of the medial wall. And you might anticipate, therefore, that his color appreciation and his vision would improve. But sadly, it did not, presumably because of the uh, tight constriction of the nerve over this bony bar posteriorly, as shown on the bottom of the slide. And therefore, he underwent further surgery with our ENT colleagues uh, to remove this bony element with improvement of his vision. And my final case, case three, is a 40-year-old lady who presented with a sphenoid wing meningioma, as shown on the top right, but who also had canal involvement. And again, the question would be whether a medial wall decompression had anything to offer in the context of canal involvement <clears throat> per se. And so we adopted, once again, a medial wall decompression via the retrocaruncular approach to the medial extraperiosteal space. So here is the retrocaruncular approach to the medial wall. Here is the malleable retractor retracting the globe laterally. The blue arrow shows the periosteum, which has yet to be reflected laterally, but having done so, exposes the medial wall, allowing us to complete the ethmoidectomy uh, and the posterior orbital floor, in addition to the bone between the two, that is the inframedial bone strut. So let's look at her a perimetry before surgery. And here you see in July 2019 with a reasonable set of isopters, but approximately a year later, you can see the inner isopter, which is this smallest one here, has markedly contracted. And so she underwent a medial wall decompression with four millimeters reduction in her exophthalmos. And her octopus visual fields, as shown here, show a marked improvement in her inner isopter but yet it is still not normal and still not as good as her, as her preoperative scans some two years earlier. And so the challenge in this patient is to know what to do next. She in fact feels there has been a major improvement and she does not wish for further surgery. And we should remember 
that quite often intervention for these tumors causes more, more, more morbidity than the tumor itself. But radiotherapy may be an option, as may be debulking of the uh, canalicular part of the tumor. Because you see on these scans here, a reminder of how compressed she is behind the orbit at this point here. So in summary of this talk, the challenge of sphenoid wing meningiomas, key points, meningiomas are largely benign, more morbidity tends to occur from treatment of the disease than the disease itself. Where there are no visual symptoms, manage conservatively. Where there is pro major proptosis or intraorbital nerve compression, consider orbital decompression, either lateral or medial, and that decision is also something of a challenge. Where there is a visual pathway defect with compression posterior to the orbit, these patients may require cranial decompression or indeed radiotherapy, and finally, always avoid progesterone treatment because this drives the uh, evolution of meningiomas. Finally, radiotherapy helps to slow down disease progression and its role and timing in management of these diseases is still being uh, understood. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. So David, Thank you very much for this very clear um, illustration of a difficult topic, as we all know. And um, since now we, we, we are in the situation, we are running a bit late, but we are allowed one or two questions or remarks if they are there. Um, David, there's one question which actually doesn't refer really to the um, uh, meaning good joma of the, of the wing, but the question is optic nerve, nerve sheath meningioma. Is it usual to have good vision despite significant proptosis on presentation? Well, um, thanks, Ray. Thank you, Christoph, and, and thanks everybody. These are two, these diseases behave in different ways, of course, and so it is possible to maintain good vision despite a large tumor volume. Don't forget a lot of the loss of the vision in sphenoid wing meningiomas due to compression. Uh, and therefore, in the absence of compression, these patients can maintain good vision. But sphenoid wing meningioma and optic nerve sheath meningioma have a different um, uh, biology and different behaviors. Yes, very nice to, to, to point that out. And there's one, 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 one other question. Would signs of orbital inflammation rule out a differential diagnosis of op, um, optic nerve sheath meningioma? I don't think so, but don't forget that congestion can look like orbital inflammation, just as Lelio and others have so well pointed out. We must never confuse the two. Thank you. So there are no other questions from, from, from the floor. And uh, so I think Lelio and myself, on behalf of um, all the speakers, would like to thank the, the, the participants. It was, a, it was a kind of east to west. We started in Singapore, Germany, we had Belgium, um, we had uh, England, Spain and, and the US. So it was a kind of wide spectrum. And I hope you find uh, or you found these uh, talks uh, interesting and helpful. And with this, um, I think I would like to, to thank everybody. And I would like to make one last remark. There are some open questions which couldn't be um, uh, which couldn't be answered, and we will try to get the speakers to come back to uh, to, to 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 you if you give you, uh, your address. Is that is that everything fine with you? With the with the okay. Then thank you very much, and have a nice evening or good night. <laughs>